Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Ministers, former colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, bear with me if you find my speech boring and long, because I think after having been Leader of the House for 20 years, I have earned this privilege. <laughs> Good morning. We gather here today to remember Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. It is fitting that we have chosen the old Parliament House here for the remembrance ceremony. Of the 60 years of Mr. Lee's parliamentary tenure, 44 years were spent at his very chamber where he expounded and delivered his vision for Singapore. Mr. Lee entered this, parliament, this chamber in 1955 as an opposition member. While the PAP only had three seats the in the Legislative Assembly of 25, it gave him a platform to get his views across to the people. Those were tumultuous times, from the Hockley bus riots, industrial strikes, high unemployment, shortage of school places, to corruption in the public service, and so on. Inside this chamber, Mr. Lee spoke for the people. Outside, he gathered a credible team and won the confidence of the people. On 21st July 1959, as the Prime Minister, Mr. Lee addressed the legislature for the first time. From his speech, I quote, this is a government consisting of people who put their ideas, their ideals, and the welfare of the people above themselves. This is a party which has the courage of this conviction, which is prepared to pursue what it believes to be the right interest of the people without deviating for opportunist reasons. This remains the ideal we strive for. When Leader of the House Graceful asked me to speak today. I reread all the speeches that Mr. Lee made since 1985. His words still ring in my ears. I could almost recall the tone, the cadence, the inflection as I read his speech. Every speech by Mr. Lee was an enriching experience. The house was always full when he spoke. He spoke of his fears and hopes trials and tribulations, sadness and joys about Singapore's past, present and future. He was always frank and open with his views. He reasoned with those who could accept reason, argued with those who disagreed with him, and rebutted those who pervade false views. As new trends form, he would change his views. For example, Mr Lee was initially against having casinos in Singapore. I remember the cabinet had several long discussions on this issue. Mr. Lee and a few of us, including me, were not convinced that the casinos were needed. He asked each one of us to explain and state our views. We debated the subject over a long period. Eventually, the compelling economic case made him change his mind. In my speech today, I would quote many of Mr. Lee's words which would better describe his beliefs values and how he cared for Singapore than my paraphrasing them. When I joined politics in 1984, Mr. Lee and the founding leadership had already put in place the important policies and institutions. These included multiracialism to protect minority rights, home ownership to give every Singaporean a stake in Singapore, CPF savings for housing, medical and retirement needs, schools for the young, health programs, and many more that made Singapore successful. I first heard Mr. Lee spoke in this chamber during the debate on the President's Address on 1st March 1985. I was sitting in the middle of the second row. It was a tour de force of his pragmatic, forward-looking approach behind Singapore's success. He said that contention for the sake of contention leads to disaster and that we do not blindly follow the principles and theories that are not part of our culture and not part of our system. Mr. Lee reminded all of us and the next generation that how different Singapore is and how important it is that we should stay different in order that we, should, in order that we can survive. He believed in doing what was right and what worked for Singapore, never mind what his critics said. He said, popular government does not mean that you have to do popular things all the time. We do not want to be unpopular to do unpopular things, but when they are necessary, they will be done. 
Some policies like land acquisition, national service, caused pain and inconvenience to those affected, but it was for the overall good. Neither was Mr Lee complacent with what Singapore had achieved. Mr Lee had a prescience to say in January 1994, in this chamber, that the challenge of the future will be totally different from the past. Ministers must adjust their policies to fit major trends. Well, in the last few years, we have seen how policies, for example, the PG package, MediShield Life and CPF Life were introduced to take into account the needs of our ageing population. In Mr Lee's mind, the most precious asset was a culture and an administration free of corruption. We must constantly be on guard against corruption and not take for granted that we will forever be immune from it. Money politics is a serious problem even in developed countries where candidates need to raise and spend huge sums to get elected. After that, you know what happened. Mr Lee had put in place a system to check and punish corruption. He would not interfere, even when his friends or colleagues flouted the rules. Many of us would have read about the recent news of the then MP Fei Yu Kok, who, after 35 years on the run, returned to Singapore and surrendered himself to the authorities. In 1985, Mr Lee revealed that he was asked to intervene in CPIB's investigation on Fei Yu Kok. He refused. Even his ministerial colleague did not receive special treatment. To Mr Lee, there is no way a minister can avoid investigation and a trial if there is evidence to support one. However, that did not mean that Mr Lee was impersonal. In fact, he cared very much for Singaporeans and those who worked with him. Last year, I recounted how he nagged me to see a specialist after one doctor diagnosed me to have TIA. I want to share another story. In 2007, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong asked me to attend Shogam on his behalf because of a scheduled conflict. On learning that I was going to Uganda, he insisted that I brought along a doctor so that if I needed any medical assistance, I would have a Singapore doctor readily available to attend to me. That concern touched my heart deeply. The rule of law was paramount in Mr Lee's vision for Singapore. Singapore must be a place that works on rules and not bend them. A political leadership that could withstand the closest scrutiny was the reason that for Singapore's existence and why we could attract foreign investments in spite of competition from many other countries. Mr Lee put in place institutions to ensure that the rule of law will outlast the people in charge. Any innuendo insinuation, allegation made against a government or minister on any impropriety will be investigated and addressed. In 1996, there, when there was disquiet about Mr Lee's property purchases, he presented himself in Parliament to state the facts. This was nine weeks after his angioplasty and stench operation. Many would have stayed home. He held himself to the same exacting standards he espoused. As Mr Lee said, that is how this place is kept clean. Mr Lee also once said, to be a goalkeeper, you need a certain Spartan quality. He had a great influence in the way we work. As a leader, I informed him that we were planning to build a new parliament building as the old parliament house was no longer adequate to meet future needs. He reminded me not to follow the example of Sri Lanka, which built a grandiose monument. Taking this sound advice, we built a new functional parliament house in proportion to our prudent approach in public spending. Mr Lee's strategic vision, long-term vision, is, was legendary, but he also paid attention to details. His whole life was dedicated for Singapore. No matter, big or small, escaped his intention, attention. In my years as minister, I had received many phone calls, sometimes in the middle of the night, and notes giving his views on matters concerning Singapore. For example, after an evening walk in the Fullerton Bay area, he sent me a note complaining about the loud music from the entertainment outlets. He said it spot the quiet ambience of the city. Another example, 
people wondered why ministers drove their cars instead of using drivers. In one of the lunches I had with him as a new minister in the 1980s, he explained that ministers should drive so that they could see the road conditions for themselves, and if there is anything to be fixed, they can tell the PWD about it. Many of you would have read other accounts of how he attended to micro-issues. Mr. Lee was a world statesman, widely admired by his peers abroad. He expanded his influence in the world well beyond a country of our size. He shared with us his powerful analysis of world affairs and helped us discern what we should learn and should not learn from other countries, even as we engage them in trade and diplomacy. I had the privilege to travel with him and Mrs. Lee on many trips. The one trip that etched deeply in my mind was the visit to London, Bonn and Paris a few months before he stepped down as Prime Minister in 1990. The warm receptions he received from British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, Chancellor Crow of Germany and President Mitron of France made me really proud to be a Singaporean. In 1988, Parliament debated the case of a US diplomat who interfered with our domestic politics. The diplomat cultivated and encouraged some Singaporeans to engage in anti-government political activities. Many MPs expressed their outrage against such interference. And as Foreign Minister then, I also spoke. After listening to the MPs' speeches, Mr. Lee could not resist himself and he stood up and weighed in. He explained that investments and trade from America with America do not make us a dependency or a client, and we are not supplicants, and that we must fight back when Americans do us in. At the same time, Mr. Lee also reminded us that America remains our strategic friend, and we should take our long-term basic interests first and not harm them when we protest against unwarranted American interference. Such was his mastery of diplomacy. Finally, it's a subject of leadership renewal. Over the decades, Mr. Lee recognised that Singapore's situation was no longer the same as that he and his first generation of leaders were in. Their unequivocal fervour for self-governing Singapore was a product of their times. Successive generations lead better lives and have access to more lucrative opportunities. To keep attracting honest and quality people into politics meant, meant moving on to more realistic rewards. Mr Lee refused to take the easy way out, like what other governments have done, which is to reward their politicians with perks hidden with, from public eyes. During the parliament sitting in 1985, Mr Lee explained why he had to introduce an honest, open and comparable reward system. Then in 1994 and year 2000, Mr Lee, then as senior minister, would return to parliament and pit his judgment on the subject against the naysayers. He reminded the House that having adequate salaries for ministers removed only one of the factors that stand in the way of recruiting talent. In January 1912, uh, 19, January 2012, Parliament debated the report on salaries for a comparable and committed government. I was sitting next to Mr. Lee when Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong spoke. He turned to me and asked, why were we doing this when we had already paid the political price? He wasn't very happy, but resigned to the fact that after more than 20 years, the people still did not understand that people, the good people were hard to attract to serve in political office, even though salary was not the reason why they served. I told Mr Lee that Prime Minister Lee has promised to review the salaries. He had to proceed with it or lose credibility for not doing what was promised. Mr Lee firmly believed that talented and committed leadership remains crucial for Singapore. In my years in Parliament, I've heard him repeat many stories to educate new MPs, every term we have new MPs, about what made Singapore work 
and to uphold our high standards. He urged, he urged us to insist on honesty and competence in the men and women who take charge of government in Singapore. And Singaporeans must insist a world must resist a world trend of falling standards in politics. He believed that Singapore established a virtuous cycle of good government, making for high growth and social progress, leading to the re-election of good government, leading to the ability to renew that good government by recruiting more good men to continue to work. The work. Mr. Go Chok Tong and Prime Minister Lee Sien-Lung Sien -Lung, have kept up the cycle. But the cycle could break if we slacken. Every new parliamentary term, we must continue to attract a group of people with good character and integrity to serve the people. They must have the vision for an extraordinary Singapore and hope and forge a bond with the people to bring us forward. A 35-year-old Mr. Lee Kuan Yew once said, this will be an era which will light up the dark pages of the history of Singapore. The page was turned during Mr. Lee's leadership. His legacy lives on in Singapore, in the values, principles and the high standards that have moved Singapore from third world to first. Successive generations of Singaporeans will do well to remember how we got here. I fervently hope that Singaporeans are committed to the same purpose as Mr. Lee had dedicated his life toward that, and that is to fight for a better Singapore for all of us. Thank you. Oh.